Well, happy, uh, let's see, All Hallows Eve, etc., etc. My costume today is, um, I was just thinking about a meeting that I just left and a breakfast that I had this morning uh, at the University of Oregon. <coughs> the breakfast, uh, the meeting was in the boardroom of LCC, but it occurred to me that many of my colleagues and no few uh, others are intimidated by, so what, I, I'm a black graduate with honors, so some people are scared by that. Go figure. Anyway, let's talk about uh, sex and culture. So the basic uh, recap is when you know better, you do better. I saw that on Oprah somewhere about people changing their addictive behaviors. Now, if what they were accustomed to was an addictive behavior and it just was normal to them, then changing that uh, is going to be difficult, but um, probably desirable for a lot of reasons. So basically, people act on what they know. And if you don't know, then you do what everybody else around you does. And if you think that is normal, because everybody else around you is doing it, then that's kind of what you'll repeat. And so one of the things that we've seen, is, especially in terms of addictive behavior, is if addictive behavior is the norm, you don't question it. So you would only question it if you came from a culture that question stuff as part of it. Like, why is this? How did this, you know, and this is often a two-year-old function, right? Two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, young children ask in set, why, why, why? Right? And if you're the parent around them, you can find that annoying, but, you know, as they grow older and they can ask more sophisticated whys, and you come up, or you don't come up with answers, you'll find people rebelling or doing stuff that you might not like. Okay? So sometimes you have to go your own way. And one of the questions that could be asked is, how do you discover your own way? So what I try and do is introduce you to stuff that if this is the first time you're hearing it, and it's a shock, and that can be scary, or if it challenges the way you were raised, I'm feeling you. I was raised the same way, albeit 50 years earlier. And so I had to see, come to a certain questioning and exploration and all that kind of stuff. So how you discover your own way. So for example, we were talking about sex and scripture. Now I'm Actually, if we get to the scripture pieces, uh, I've included them at the end of the lecture, whether we get to them or not, just so you can look at them. Because, and the thing that I would say generally about scripture, and I'll just kind of give you a recap, there's a reason why in the United States we have separation of church and state, and that's a good thing. And the reason it's a good thing is because the United States was formed at a time when they were having a revolution against people who had themselves had a revolution against the church, when the church was the state. So I'm wearing a cap and gown, and that's dating back to the time in Europe when the school was the church. Okay, so when you are basically going through graduation and everybody's wearing their cap and gown, this was literally when the church ran the colleges. And we're, we're wearing, wearing monks' robes. And the students would walk to class, you know, wearing the board that they would be writing on, on their head. Right? And that's why this is called, you know, the cap and gown, the cap part. This is the cap part. This is actually what you were supposed to be writing your lessons on in school, studying with the monks. Right? And then they would hand you a sheepskin. Literally, a sheepskin. 
writing parchment. And that's what your diploma is. All right? So, all that history. So, when I talked about earlier, when we were talking about the alcohol and drug section. So, for 800 years, in European culture, beer, drinking, and partying was associated with college. It was normal. Because, like, we're talking about Germany, yo, right? Czech, you know, the Czech Republic. I mean, if you check your beers outside of PBR, where are they coming from? Heineken, Bex. Okay, there's a reason why all those, you know, Pilsners, lagers, where are they coming from? Uh, what kind of words are those, right? Those are literally being produced by the church. And they had non, what we would call non-scientific values around that. Well, guess what? In the early church, in the Catholic church, priests could have wives and families. Say so they only started doing the celibacy thing, you know, only for definitely less than a thousand years. But they weren't necessarily teaching people about their sexuality. So... Part of the whole sex and scripture out, the reason I get into that is because understanding where we came from today and why there is such a silence about it and not necessarily skill building, what happened with the church and breaking away from the church, that is, when the church was the Catholic church in the Western world and people protested the power of the Catholic church and that's where the protest. Protestant side of Christianity came from, but they're still coming from a European point of view, both of them, that forms not only the church, but also the state. Because the king got his authority from the church. Who crowned the king? The high priest. Yeah, could you get married and divorced? Uh, no, because we Catholic and we ain't getting divorced. Well, I want to get divorced. I want to marry this other chick and I want to marry this other chick. Protestant. I mean, that's, notice how I subtly wove in the whole sex thing with politics. So the problem with that, and I know this, you know, people, this will be scary, but you know, it's the truth. Don't talk to me about Muslim terrorists. They're amateurs compared to Christians on this continent. 150 million Native Americans, let's just say, just in North America alone, that's in North, Central, and South America, that 150 million. Okay, it's just in North America alone, 60 million Native Americans reduced to 3 million today. Nine million European women burned as witches. Slavery. Uh, yeah. The Ku Klux Klan. Uh, don't tell me about Bin Laden. He's an amateur. Only 3,000? <coughs> Please. Hitler. Hitler was raised Catholic, and the people in his army were Lutherans, doing 6 million Jews. Hello? Don't tell me about Muslims. They're amateurs. So that's why we have separation of church and state. Because no, we ain't playing that. That's why we have our rules of evidence. No, you accuse me of a crime, come up with the evidence. And I have the right to interrogate witnesses. Unlike what was happening in the Inquisition, which was being run by the, ch the Catholic Church. If I want your stuff, I just all I have to do is accuse you of a crime. I don't even have to produce any evidence. I can just convince a priest that it, and they take your stuff without evidence and convict you. You don't even get a lawyer. So these are the folks that eventually, unquestionably, then set our sexual policies in terms of what's okay, what's not, but they, we don't necessarily get to question that, especially once we get to having our 21st century science. So that's why I started with the science first. Because oftentimes when you're dealing with kind of like guilt and all these other things, people will drink or use to get rid of their guilty feelings and then do what they're going to do without in a less than conscious state.
catch bugs, get pregnant, you know, affect their babies with the drugs they take. And that's both male and female. Had a client come in last week, basically said, yeah, I have a special needs kid because I was using when I got my wife pregnant, who wasn't using. Kid came out special needs. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, it's possible, actually. We don't, just don't have great data on it. Because we have the kind of society where, oh, we're just going to look at mom using during pregnancy. But there is data showing that mom didn't drink or use at all, and it was the sperm of dad, drug-affected dad, that messed up the kid. Right? But you're not hearing that at Planned Parenthood. I'm not slamming Planned Parenthood, I'm just saying. There's lots of data out there that hasn't necessarily hit seen the light of day. But we were talking about sex, right? You're civilians, not professionals. So you can have opinions and belief, and I can have opinions and belief too, but a pro has to follow the science regardless of their beliefs. Because we have to serve everybody. Right? I have to serve racist skinheads, conservative Republicans, and Democrats alike, all of them. Okay? So my personal opinion, I believe that all human beings are equal. The only superior ones are the ones who unite others and feed, shelter, and clothe, soothe, heal those less fortunate than those. They, they are the superior people, if anybody's superior. You don't do that, you ain't superior. I don't care how much money you got. Okay? You either believe that all people are your relatives, or you don't. Now, you make exceptions as to how close you become to some relatives, but all people are your relatives. That's my personal cultural belief. It also happens to coincide with certain spiritual beliefs, too. Okay? You can believe your scriptures are direct revelation from God or human edit jobs for the purposes of gaining power over other humans. Now, there are... Come on. You can believe, so there are people, you know, I have clients who say, look, the world, I believe the world was created six, five or 6,000 years ago. Okay, you can believe that if you want. That's fine. But I'll tell you, I was ready to believe that, you know, Christ, as a Christian, to the degree that I am Christian, African Christians don't believe that. So where do we go with that? All right? Or, human edit jobs for the purposes of gaining power over other humans. So the question still remains, what if it was you or yours? You or your, yourself or your family? How would you want to be treated? So, part of the sex spirituality thing comes down to what is optimally healthy for you. That may not be what you were scripturally taught. Because based on when scriptures came down the pike, we know better now, somewhat, for some things. So, I don't question or present information unless I have a source for it, and generally I can provide you those sources if I don't tell you what they are, generally speaking. So, my spiritual beliefs happen to correspond with the science. That is, sexual diversity exists. That's a fact. That's a scientifically demonstrable, repeatable, replicable fact. Sexual diversity exists. As well as human diversity exists. Okay? So you just deal with those facts with skills and knowledge rather than, you know, and then you can have your morality drive driven from that or not. But, okay, we, that is, we is in quotes because, you know, what do you mean by we or what would I mean by we? We once taught with skills and knowledge. I'm saying our traditional cultures 
starting easily 2,000 years back. Once taught with skills and knowledge. Now, some of those cultures got destroyed. Some of those European cultures got destroyed. Remy Kalalang, the Her Kalalang, that's who Remy Ka the Kalalang is, Remy Kalalang and Harris is me. In the year 2000, uh, responded to a request for proposal to create a training for the most difficult uh, welfare reform population, which was addicted women of color. So the idea is, with welfare reform, we're kicking people off the welfare rolls and we're giving them job training and all that. And they were finding that the hardest people to move off of those particular, off of, into jobs was people who were strung out and poor, multiple kids, no job skills, et cetera, et cetera. So you got to get them off drugs, into treatment, get them into job training, get them into school, retain them in school, childcare. All these wraparound services. How do you do that? And then how do you train the system to do that? So the money determined what the focus of the training was. So I'm good at coming up with acronyms for stuff. So I came up with CRASH, which stands for classism, racism, addiction, sexism, heterosexism, which was the original focus of the grant. The grant wanted us to focus on addiction and racism and sexism and heterosexism and classism. Okay, fine. Crash. It's a crash course, right? So, on this particular topic, heterosexism is basically the idea heterosexism slash homophobia, right? So, it is the basically sexism is the idea that. Men are superior to women. So heterosexism and the norm is male. That is, what does it mean to be professional in a workplace? Have you heard that term, professional, in your workplaces? What does it mean to be professional? Mm -hmm. You're respectful, well behaved, well composed. Mm -hmm. What do you mean, well behaved? You don't go around doing things that are immature or inappropriate by general standards. Um, and just making sure that you have yourself composed. Okay. What if somebody does something that legitimately makes you angry? Yeah, to keep yourself composed. Composed. And that is speak in a level voice. Don't shout, don't cry, don't. You might want to throttle them, but. But don't. But don't. <laughs> okay, no personal attacks. Right, right. Well, who set that standard? I don't know. Well, okay, we can look at who it benefits to do that. Who deals with life like that on a regular basis? Men. Hmm. Okay. Remember that story I told you about whiskey? Where whiskey came from? Where you hear that? You remember that? Okay. Our English word whiskey comes from the Gaelic word who is gay. Okay? Whiskey is made from grain, right? Mm -hmm. At the time that this term was invented, women controlled the drug technology. And they made a rule that's still a rule in Ireland and Scotland today. Nobody makes whiskey until everybody has bread first. Oh, right. Remember that? Yes. Who would make a rule like that? Women or men? And you said? Women. Duh, right? So women are at least, you know, equal if not superior in that particular situation, because they're going to make decisions that benefit the kids and family. Right? Mm -hmm. 
So when we talk about general, this comes back to the whole question. You know, well, who invented gene general or generic? And who benefits from that? I'm not saying it's necessarily good or bad, but it does benefit who's making the rules, not just them that makes has the gold. That's the way to look, but, right? So our generic came from somewhere, right? And sometimes it's optimal and sometimes it's not. So with heterosexism, look, I'm heterosexual. The world is normed for me because I'm oriented towards the opposite sex, hetero meaning diff different, right? But not everybody rolls that way. And that's a scientific fact. Not about political correctness, it's a scientific fact, period. Now, I wasn't raised to necessarily know about that difference. Those folks had to basically go through their own civil rights movement, legitimately. Because part of the people being burned as witches were also homosexuals. Part of people putting, putting, put in the death camps were homosexuals with Hitler, etc. So, exploring this particular thing from the scientific point of view, the American Psychological Association in 1973 basically made a ruling that homosexuality, that is same-sex sexuality in relationships, is not a mental illness. Now, civilians, you don't have to worry about, you, know, you don't have to believe that, if that's against your spiritual beliefs or political beliefs, whatever. But as pros, okay, that's what it is. Now, you might have feelings about, see, it's the terminology, and rather not so, so much about political correctness, but understand why people will want to call themselves whatever they want to call themselves, for their own reasons. Like I corrected somebody who was 23 when he was referring to his girlfriend as colored. I'm going, wait, stop. <laughs> it's black <laughs> or African American, okay? Because you ain't a 70 year old southerner. You a white boy from Oregon, <laughs> okay? So you should know <laughs> that colored went out in the 50s. <laughs> way before you were born. So if you're like uncomfortable talking to an educated black guy and you don't want to offend, you offended me, but it's cool. I'm just educating you, all right? It's black or African-American, however she wants to identify, right? So it isn't a sexual preference because nobody would choose as a preference to be something that everybody is talking about negatively. That's so gay. Faggot. Butch. Whatever, you know. Dyke. Lesbo. You know, I mean, the generic culture disses, right? So they say it's an orientation. I was born that way. And I gradually discovered. And there's some scientific basis for seeing it that way. Okay. So, APA basically said that in 73. Gender identity dysphoria basically it simply means in DSM-4, and I think now 5, though I haven't read 5 all the way through, what that simply means as a condition, it's not a mental illness, it just means you have some questions about your identity because everybody talked about it negatively and you feel bad. Or you got sexually abused or any number of things that are negative. And so they have this condition in DSM so you can get insurance for counseling. Essentially that's the, the effect of it. As well as whether you want to have a sex change operation if you feel you were born in the wrong body which is, again, a, a whole cultural piece around the uh, way our culture deals with it. The World Health Organization, that is the UN's health organization, basically made a similar ruling uh, affecting international practice. 
accepted international practice that goes along with APA in 87. So when we look at terminology, the intersext, now the intersext is a term from out of the science of anthropology and it goes like this. Let's say there's a continuum. Continuum is a range. So, let's say on this side is what we call normal. Where heterosexists say this is normal. Okay? That is, you have one set of visible, functional genitalia and secondary sex characteristics, if you remember your biology. Okay? So, primary sex characteristics is genitalia. Secondary characteristics are things like no Adam's apple, no beard, no breasts, blah, 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 blah. Right? So normal is like boys and girls. Right? With clear, at least from the normal point of view. And I'm putting normal in quotes. Two... And intersex is actually all along this continuum, but it means two visible sets of genitalia and other characteristics. And the current figure is about 3% 3 mil, 3 of human births planet-wide today. That's about 4 million folks a year. Every year, sorry fundamentalist Christians, every year for the last 200,000. You do the math. Okay? Now, and on a continuum. And sometimes you will have, so, I mean, the obvious questions, no, they can't fertilize themselves and get themselves pregnant. Okay? But, so for example, with the Olympics, that South African runner who runs as a woman, and her grandma said, you know, and they, you know, drug tested her and blah, 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 blah. Oh, you're, you're, the, the the people that she the women that she defeated oh she's a she's actually a guy well no look down there she's a girl her grandma says I changed her diapers okay intersex Jamie Lee Curtis the actress intersex they exist I'm just saying that's a fact get over it that's the science. All right now, in certain cultures, basically, if this has been going on for two hundred thousand years, cultures of tradition, and that's still three percent is rare, right? So ninety-seven percent of everybody else is what we call "quote unquote" normal. But understand, in science, normal is what happens repeatedly and predictably. Three percent is like repeatedly and predictably. Okay? So you squ scatter four million people like that over the planet. So, people are going to make accommodations, particularly if it's your kid or your relative. They're going to build into their society, oh, well, this is normal, it's happening. And because it happens so rarely, they must be special. Not to like pound this point, it's like, unless you think the devil is messing with the DNA code, this is the DNA code, not political correctness, right? DNA. So when we have in our language the whole, G, in terms of terminology, 
GLBTQ, and this is an old slide, so gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, asexual, it, there's, yeah, there's more current terminology, but basically what we're saying with our language, it's, it's about who is sexing who. So being gay or lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, queer, questioning is actually beyond just who you're having sex with. Way beyond that. But our language doesn't necessarily capture that. So that's why, as a native person, I go with two-spirited. In the native point of view, where these people existed, they basically felt that creator is beyond gender and has male and female within, uh, that whole, within creation, and these people are lucky to have two spirits in one body. So that makes them special. And so that means that even if you have a person in a male body and they cross-dress in female clothing, they can be a marriage counselor for heterosexual couples because they've got both sides. They can see both sides. Or you can have a woman warrior or a woman war chief, any number of roles, several roles, right? So two-spirit is what we say in Indian country. So seven genders, for example, among the Osage people, they have seven genders, only two of which we'd recognize as heterosexual. Now this started disappearing with American conquest of Native Americans, though gene expression isn't being suppressed. So when you start doing studies, like with Matt Master and Johnson, you see a greater uh, incidence of... Um, Bisexuality, for example, if you sample uh, Indian ro rodeos and stuff like that, and there's actually been work done on sexuality, asking people questions. Higher incidence of uh, bisexuality among certain Native American groups. Twelve kinds of marriage as a reference in Africa. And the, there's slides to I'll show you, be showing you, it kind of supports that. So, when we start looking at crash, one of the things that we begin to look at, so what crash, the term for crash, the technical term for crash, just like intersexed, is the term that we have for two, or, or up to two visible sets of functioning genitalia, or the mixtures that we have on that continuum between here and there intersectionality, intersectionality, is basically the idea that there are intersecting systems of discrimination that affect people. All right, so for example, you're going to college. The cultural default of college is middle class. So if you're not middle class, you have to assimilate into middle class culture. Because the assumption is you're coming here to better your economic situation and to have a job, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So there ain't no poor college professors. Well, there are. But the assumption is middle class, right? So that's classism as a system of discrimination. Racism. One race over others, or one race is superior, or the values of one race are super considered superior to others. A, so addiction, some addictions are not treated equally. Rich junkies, okay, are treated better than homeless junkies. And not because of the insurance. Okay, rich alcoholics, different than poor alcoholics. Okay? So, skin privilege, socioeconomic status set privilege, sexual orientation privilege. As a heterosexual, my orientation is considered normal. Others are other. That's a privilege. 
could even talk about black male privilege. I get to talk about racism. Black women might not get to. So there's an intersection there. Racism, sexism, classism. Okay, intersectionality basically combines, says, okay, these all intersect in a particular way. There's ageism, ableism. You can get into that more if you want later. Okay, so for example, then, in terms of gays and lesbian, there's entertainment value like Will and Grace, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, Girls Gone Wild, whatever. I mean, it's like people trip and have varying levels of acceptance uh, or conditional acceptance. So, for example, in Indian country, in at least 117 Native American languages, there's a word for a third gender. Neither male nor female, but like creator, containing transcending both. So there are symbols uh, from, say, four different groups. So, so, for example, one symbol is a dragonfly, and the symbolism as a youth, it spends its time in the water. When it comes into its power as an adult and knows who it is as an adult, it takes wings and flies. So that's one symbol. Uh, rain, because it connects heaven, it connects and nourishes heaven and earth. So actually, you know, the GLBT symbol of the rainbow is actually not far off from the native thing. Uh, in hair, hairstyles, women in, on the Southwest, women wear their hair in a bun, tied up in a bun on both sides of the head. Men wear their hair loose, so a symbol for a two-spirit uh, in the Southwest is having both, one side or the other. And then in the tribes, uh, in uh, the Plains tribes, women wear their hair in a braid, men wear their hair loose. And this is also a symbol for a contrary person, and a contrary person is a type of uh, sacred or medicine person that does things opposite everybody else, and that's their power. So two-spirit is def a definitely different way of looking at this beyond GLBT, which, not to be too pejorative or heterosexist, it's like who's, it's beyond who's Zoom and who. So in Turtle Island, so for example, in the anthropology literature, the word for a third gender, the anthropological term is burdash, which is, a burdash is actually an Arab word for a male sex slave, so obviously two spirits aren't, it's not about sexual slavery, so it's weird that the Western anthropology term comes from a whole other culture anyway. So generically translated, those 117 different words into two spirit references to two spirits within one gender. So for example, the Osage seven genders, and this is the slide where I name it. So the first two are heterosexual. So female hetero, wako, male hetero, mika. Male body, female spirit, winte. Male body, female spirit, wingshke, which these people get to participate in women's secret societies and women's rituals with women. Joshi, female body, male spirit. These individuals get to participate in ma male rites of passage and secret ceremonies. They also might have a role in terms of uh, being warriors or negotiators or traders or chiefs or other things like that. Joshi, male, female body, male spirit. And Wakandaji, a person of mystery, could be either body and beyond the previous concepts. We don't really have a concept for it in English, so that's as far as I can go with that. So just the idea that even if we were basically to look at gender and sexuality, the difference between gender, that's a role, and gender expression, 
how you express that role. Just to be able to basically give some people some flex room. To begin to think about that. So the, part of the reason I'm presenting this is like, okay, this is actually traditional. It's definitely going beyond gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer questioning. No. There's an actual place for you. And we need you in this role. It's special, rather than being something hidden or something to be ashamed about. So, uh, 12 Kinds of Marriage. This is uh, from Audre Lorde. Audre was a uh, black lesbian poet and writer. On the west coast of Africa, the fawn of Dahomey, the Dahomey is now called Benin, still have 12 different kinds of marriage. One of them is known as giving the goat to the buck, where a woman of independent means marries another woman who then may or may not bear children, all of whom belong to the bloodline of the first woman. Some marriages of this kind are arranged to provide heirs for women of means who wish to remain free, that is, free of a man, and some are lesbian relationships. Marriages like this occur throughout Africa in several different places among different peoples. Routinely, the women involved are accepted members of their communities, evaluated not by their sexuality, but by their respective places in, within the community. And this is from Herskovitz's Dahomey, two volumes out of Northwestern. So you should know that Dahomey is now called Benin. It's in West Africa. I've been there. This is where the Amazons, or Amazais, originally came from. So not Xena, <laughs> okay? But these were women who either led all female armies or mixed co-ed armies, but the basic idea with the women warriors is you go into battle, you come back with the heads of two of your enemies, one in each hand. If you only come back with one, yours is added to it. And there's pictures of them. Warrior women holding two heads. And we're talking about, you know, not only just going up against Africans, but against Europeans. In the full wars against colonialism. And so if Hersk Herskovitz is writing this in 1967, as a result of living among them, that's happening now. And also, more to the point, it's been happening for thousands of years before European conquest or European forms of Christianity. And so, note within that, so a woman of means marries another woman who might have children, which means that she's get, they're not doing, you know, there's no sperm banks, okay? So that they're having a sex, they might have a sexual relationship for the purpose of procreating making children with a man of the tribe, but they belong to her, this couple, not him. So he may have a relationship with them because, and that may or may, may not be sexual, because they all live together in a tribal situation. I mean, and this is just one of 12 kinds of arrangements. Another example, a 92-year-old Ifik Ibibo, woman of Nigeria, recalls her love for another woman. I had a woman friend to whom I revealed my secret. She was very fond of keeping secrets to herself. We acted as husband and wife. We always moved hand in glove, and my husband and hers knew about our relationship. The villagers nicknamed us twin sisters. When I was out of gear with my husband, she would be the one to restore peace. I often sent my children to go and work for her in return for her kindnesses to me. My husband, being more fortunate to get more pieces of land than her husband, allowed some to her, even though she was not my co-wife with him. Right? So, I mean, you draw that out on a map. Uh, okay, two women, two men, their kids, they're sharing resources, they're, okay. All right. 
we can't, this, I'm, an, I'm speaking as an American, this is difficult for us to wrap our minds around. You know, a group, well, this is a group, well, this is a tribal context, okay, in contemporary Africa. So I'm just saying, all the things about sneaking around and running around and all the kind of thing, this is actually a more healthy way of dealing with human sexual diversity than just thinking, oh, well, man and woman, you know, for, for the people that where monogamy works, more power to them. But tribally, there are other models. Uh, let's see. So this is a, a, another piece in terms of, a, in, out of another s discipline, uh, women's studies. While a piece, this is Audre Lorde writing still, um, a piece of black woman remembers the old ways of another place when we enjoyed each other in a sisterhood of work and play and power. Other pieces of us less functional eye one another with suspicion. In the interest of separation, black women have been taught to view each other as always suspect, heartless competitors for the scarce male, the all-important prize that could legitimize our existence. This dehumanizing denial of self is no less lethal than the dehumanization of racism which, to which it is so closely allied. So she's also talking about uh, intersectionality. So the poet, the point being, whether you're a black lesbian or not, people are socialized to view others like them as competitors rather than relying on themselves or their own inner resources for validation. Outside of this, we all look like we're competing for different things. So she's saying, look at what, why we think that's normal. So, in brain reward, signal is signal. Fantasy works because at the cellular level, imagined or anticipated events stimulate just like real ones do. And on the individual cellular level, the individual neuron can't tell the difference. Anticipation actually could be, I think there was a Vulcan saying from Star Trek, having is not so pleasing as wanting. It's not logical, but it's often true. Okay, so sex and uh, the internet engage your addictive attention just like food and drugs do. Works the same way. Because uh, it's what your brain, body, and identification with your brain and body does. So I'm not so subtly saying, okay, you're more than just your brain and your body. But for people who are basically kind of stuck within that identification, that is, you are your thoughts and your body, and if you think that's it, then that's all you'll do. So one of the things that happens that people get into situation with cravings, if they aren't able to interrupt the cravings, they'll just follow them. Cravings are a form of thought. They're just a repetitive, intrusive thought. So either you learn the skill of diverting your thoughts, or changing your thoughts, or detaching from your thoughts, or other behaviors. So calming and self-soothing works as well. So, in um, Joanne Lulin, I've mentioned before, this is uh, her website. When I, this slide was developed uh, when uh, we in the Oregon Institute of Addiction Studies brought her uh, to talk about um, what was then the beginning of the internet and uh, internet addictions and the relationship between sexuality and recovery. And she was a lesbian, or is a lesbian sex therapist in recovery. Alcoholism, mostly. 
And so when she call, describes herself as a psycho comedian, what that means is, look, I'm a psychologist, and I think we need to be funny about this. Because being a comedian, you can tell a certain kind of truth. But she also sees people as a therapist, too. So she's done a number of books, and if you go to her, um, her website, you'll see kind of what that, that's about. Um, lesbian erotic dance, butch, femme, androgyny, and other rhythms. So a butch form of uh, being a, a, a gender expression for being a lesbian, femme. So one of the things that when we, we, we brought her, so you know, she has uh, blonde hair falling past her shoulders and lipstick and makeup, et cetera, et cetera. And she had just come from a segment on Geraldo, lesbians who look like girls. Well, wait, lesbians are girls. What do you mean look like girls? Like they're supposed to look, wear plaid and boots, combat, what? So one of the books she wrote, uh, period, it's a girl's guide to menstruation with a parent's guide, i.e., again, how do you have the talk? So maybe more people feel comfortable going to Barnes & Noble, check, getting the book and giving to the kid, just be, whatever, you know? I mean, she said, well, people weren't having the conversation. Everything a young girl needs to know to prepare her own body's changes, plus a removable parent's guide. So, here's what she pointed out, which I thought was one of, uh, the, it was a big revelation to me, even though I'm not in the program. In the big, big book of AA. To sum up, and she basically said, you know, in terms of the reason that sex, there's a reason that sex is a recovery issue. So she said, on page 69, I go, no way, really? Yes, on page 69. Okay. To sum up about sex, we earnestly pray for the right ideal for guidance in each questionable situation for sanity and for the strength to do the right thing. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. We think of their needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the imperious urge when to yield would mean heartache. So this is 1939. That Bill W. and Dr. Bob are coming up with this. All right? So it's almost had, if you can see the Christian-esque, almost Catholic, tone of this. The imperious urge. Throw yourself into service. And oh, when to yield would mean heartache. So when, a lot, when Joanne is basically talking about, okay, well that's nice for 1939 if you can pull that off. That's nice if you can actually refrain from having a new relationship for your first year of recovery. But celibacy doesn't work for the Catholic Church. How is it going to work with drunks? Her words. How is it going to, how setting up boundaries going to work for people with no boundaries? And what are those boundaries going to be? And, you know, then how do you deal with the guilt thing? So before addictions, we, we try and start with health, you know, and she asked the question, why should the field be concerned? For example, that 12-step approach to sex basically boils down to don't hurt anybody, which again is a prohibition, but not what do you do? And then there's within the 12-step, the 13th step. So the 12th step is basically... Having had a revelation, you go out and spread the message to other suffering alcoholics. The 13th step is not official. It's basically a practice in which you basically prey on newcomers coming to meetings. Here, let me take, me under, take you under my wing uh, bed. Uh, oh, yeah. Right? 
So, yeah, no sexual relationships for a first year of recovery. Uh, celibacy. So she's saying, look, I'm a sex therapist. That don't happen. And what has happened with a lot of people, not only do they have a lot of guilt around sex, but some people have been sexually abused. That's what's driving their addiction. How do they have healthy sexual relationships? What does that look like? All right, so the field then started looking at sexuality around, S around a particular STI, uh, sexually transmitted infection, AIDS. And then sex became a recovery issue. So especially if you're a sexually abu sexual abuse victim, quote unquote sexual minority, that's a GLBT person, self-medicating due to trauma or guilt in general, but Definitely because of sexuality, because remember that statistic from the old Sharp unit, 75% of the adolescent women that they had in treatment had been sexually abused or date raped. And that was driving their abuse. And she pointed out, and I've said this before here, portrayals of sex while sober. So she's pointing out, look, how do you learn to have sex? Not by watching your parents. So fumble and grope, internet porn, movie portrayals. Uh, you know, combinations of all those, right? But there is no sex school unless you go online, right? So here we go again with, you know, sex and internet addictions. You see why I'm putting this together, right? Because, so natural rewards. So one of the things she points out, sex done right gets you high. So people in recovery have guilt around feeling high, around feeling high in addition to whatever they may have done to get or be sexual or been abused around sex. So she talks about stop and start. Now, what I want to point out in terms of, because we're on television, there's a certain way you do TV and this is the way I do TV because I was taught by this, by certain role models. You make it interesting. No dead air. Don't stand in one place. Because television already causes you to stare, right? So it has to be a moving image. So when you look at editing, and just look at this in your favorite movies or newscasts or whatever, the image does not stay still for longer than three to five seconds. Now, the reason I'm setting this up is look at portrayals of sex on television in movies. Outside of porn, your typical love scene is three to five minutes. Right? And so if you were relying on this, on television, movies, etc., as a role model for how long sex should take, I mean, the women, in, well, not just the women, Anybody, but you know, if you ask women, how it, should sex only be three to five minutes? They go, uh, no. Half an hour of foreplay at least, right? Where do you learn to do that? Not through porn, which will uh, actually loop those three to five minutes together. People have done <laughs> social recons on that. Like, well, yeah, right. How do you learn how to have sex? So those things are basically driven by the technical requirements of doing television, doing film, not actual people doing it, as it were. Okay? So she says, because, for example, so many people have been sexually abused, basically the way television and media portrayals portray the sex act is you start and you go till you both go the, the big orgasm. Whenever that happens, right? It's orgasm dynamics. Well, because the most important organ in sexuality is the brain, 
if you have trauma around sexuality, somebody asked me why uh, fire engines are red. Why are fire engines red? And your name? Alex. Okay, Alex. The type of fire, and when I give you an answer, say, okay. All right, Alex, the type of fire engine we're talking about has four ladders and three men, right? Okay. And everybody knows that three times four is 12. Okay. And there's 12 inches as a ruler. Okay. And Queen Elizabeth, she was a ruler. Okay. And she had ships that sailed the sea. Okay. And in the sea, there are fish. Okay. And the fish have fins. Okay. And the fins fought the Russians. And that's why fire engines are red ox, because they're always Russian. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Off the wall humor, <laughs> but it illustrates memory is associative. Like memories are stored together and they are recalled together, and often it doesn't make any logical sense like that joke <laughs> until the punchline. Okay? So is a funny way, crazy, off-the-wall, old fire sign theater bit that I learned while getting stoned in high school, right? Ah, ha, ha. But it basically illustrates that in terms of if you've been sexually abused, even if you're having sex with somebody you love, the abuse comes up in flashbacks because you're associating it with sex, even though, even though the sex happened before puberty. For example, is that like PTSD? That's like a PTSD experience, right? How PTSD works is basically like password encryption. Have I talked about this before? A little bit. I think. Maybe the second, second week, I think you talked about PTSD a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so in computer terms, this is your brain <laughs> or your mind, right? And you have specific memories, right? So just like that joke, right? Really? Three times four ladders, three men, three times <laughs> four is 12, 12 inches in a ruler, Queen Elizabeth, what? Okay, whatever, right? You have separate data points. Here's how memory works. It's not like videotape. It's like a computer with graphics, text, formatting, all that stuff gets saved in different places on the disk and then it gets reassembled in a file. Okay? So your memories get rewritten too. Right? Sound goes one place, light goes another place, how you felt, things you thought. All right, so what happened? So PTSD... Really bad stuff happened to you. Okay? That gets locked away. Password encrypted. So you forget. Forget. Okay? And then you forget anything that is remotely associated. So the password could be the actual event. The password to unlock this memory can be actual events, it can be like events, or similar events, and you don't get to consciously decide what that is. It's off the wall like that joke. And so then what happens when, so also, so it's like events and also time and also permission. Now the permission could be you decide it's safe to talk about it because there's been enough time or somebody mentions it. Okay, and so what happens, you could be Whatever the event is, thinking about, you know, you're, you're falling in love for the first time, second time, or multiple times. You don't remember the abuse. All of a sudden, it comes up. 
the recall gets leaked out either in a dream or you just get these disconnected images and these feelings and, oh, don't touch me there. That person used to touch me there. And they're just touching you where you're, they're trying to just make you feel good and you freeze up, right? And so Joanne says, look, this stuff happens. And when you had drunk, drank to forget it or used to forget all that, which is frequent, then it also becomes associated with the drug experience, too. So what do you do? Oh, well, that didn't work. Let's drink more. Right? So part of the, the problem, for example, with date rape drugs, which are designed to induce amnesia, doesn't always work. You have a brownout. Some part of you remembers, somewhere. So, what Joanne says is, okay, as a strategy then, and as part of the recovery process, when either, because she says, look, men have been sexually abused too. By women, right? So, for example, that movie Antoine Fisher, which I think is a great if you haven't, you know, seen it. Kid has an anger management issue, and part of the anger management issue was being physically and sexually abused. So that when he finally falls in love with someone, it's like, wow, I don't know what to do. And, you know, he's in the Navy, so the guys are saying, you know, you're supposed to go out and, you know, in different ports of call and, you know, participate in the sex industry, and he doesn't want to do that. What, are you gay? And he beats them up, right? And gets thrown in the brick, you know? And, well, what's going on? What's going on? Why are you so angry about this? Well, here's what happened. So, you know, when he finally does get a girlfriend, you know, it's, it's Hollywood, but, you know, it's like, yeah, he freezes up. So she, it's stop and start. Because most sexual portrayals, you start... You go to the big O. No interruption, right? But you, if you've had any kind of trauma, you freeze up. So what you have to do, and you, since you've never been taught to deal with that reality, Joanne said, stop. Wait. Start again when it's safe. That means you actually have to communicate. Which means you have to have an ethic of communicating first. That's why when I introduce safer sex, communication is key. It's not just about, you know, sexual, sexually transmitted diseases. It's about, okay, I've never told anybody this before, but this happened. Right? So we should be healers for each other, especially with this. So so stop and start with the proper boundaries. So the proper boundaries are basically you've done, you know, you, you've shared, uh, shared your, your secrets. That means you actually have to be aware of them and have resolved them first, hopefully. So when we talked about, say for sex, sex is an expression between those able to consent based on their understanding of those implications. Besides, as pregnancy is only for heterosexuals generally, knowing the STD, that is, and also HIV and um, hepatitis C virus status of your partner, as well as herpes. So looking at uh, the boundary issues, if there's a power differential, uh, ethics, age, you know, you're cheating on your spouses with each other, um, whatever, whatever it is, all those things that you bring to that. So the age of consent actually in Oregon for women is not 16. Sex with a child under 16 is statutory rape. Sex with a girl, woman, 16 to 18 years of age, if you are over 18, is contributing to the sexual delinquency of a minor. Punishable by law if they want to make an issue of it. So 
So I didn't specify that the other day, but other folks have. So. So when you talk, we talk about what a healthy sexual relationship is, and we began to talk about that last time. So when people consume various media like Cosmopolitan, 43 sex tricks that will amaze him. I mean, again, though, you know, they make billions of dollars basically with those kind of portrayals however accurate they are. Dr. Ruth, Dr. Maltz, now who Dr. Maltz is, Wendy Maltz is a local sex therapist who is an abuse survivor who basically talks about couples who've been sexually, or one or both had been sexually abused and how do you therapeutically and relationally work through that. So a lot of people learn by trial and error, and basically that's orgasm mechanics and cuddling, and or cuddling. But only because that's what's talked about. There's no formal training necessarily. So when Joanne talks about being a person in recovery, stop and start, and developing other techniques along those lines, um, there are materials for looking at what that is. Um, both in my preference books rather than the net because books start slow so the internet engages our addictive attention in much the same way that television does except it's two-way so using many of the same techniques so unlike television it's interactive so because of this, you experience it as more intense than human interactions and become addicted to the experience, and of course you want to repeat it over and over. So this is why, for example, sexting and texting, sexting works. Thanks. And this is also why, for example, you get into chat rooms and it's just typing words on a screen with somebody that is taken on an identity, and that's why that becomes so intense, too. Part of the piece is your, it's like anticipation. And it becomes an addictive experience in itself. Okay, so in case of, for example, porn, then you become addicted to the experience and imprint on it, much more so than any human interaction. So it becomes, you experience it as more intense than a human interaction, and that's where your actual human interactions can fail because, well, they're not like your fantasy object, which wasn't real to begin with, except in your head, where you made it more intense. At the moment, the cure seems to be abstinence. That is, from the internet and developing human interaction and starting out slow and then beginning to imprint on people or a person. Okay, so therapy to the degree that it exists follows the same model as with a drug. It's essentially abstinence or cutting back. Abstinence being the preferred to cutting back. So, for example, and I talked about this, and since they gave me five minutes, this will be the first of five, several slides that I'll leave up, uh, or actually leave in Moodle, right? So we actually talked about why we had separation of church and state. So, for example, the Koran, allowing multiple wives for one man, followed by the interpretation, a wise man only has one. 
context was war and war widows. You were allowed to take your brother's widow and children into your family. King James Bible, for, begin, for, for example, being interpreted as forbidding race mixing because black people were cursed by God and white people are pure because Jesus is white. Or any sexual position other than the, quote, missionary position, man on top. Sodomy, sodomy variously defined as any ejaculation which doesn't result in a baby. That includes, sodomy also includes oral sex, anal sex, homosexual sex. Uh, Leviticus, for example, the original, in the original language uses two different words for man in the scriptural most cited against homosexuality. So the one that you're forbidden to have sex with is a male temple priest, prostitute in another religion. If you are in the nation of Israel. The Kama Sutra in India teaching about infidelity so that you can prevent and avoid it, not how to do it without being caught. And uh, multiple references in the principles of Mott regarding sexual conduct, fidelity, faithfulness, right conduct. And I'll put uh, the rest of the slides up and uh, you can look at them. So we're at about the midterm. It'll go out next Thursday and do back a week later in week seven. All right, roll music. Have a good weekend. Have a safe Halloween. Don't let those ghouls and goblins get you. Miss Oregon, eh? Or Miss Lane County?